Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's sold out webinar with the National Humanities Center and the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled From Democracy to Authoritarianism, the Death of the Roman Republic. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Michael Fontaine from Cornell University and Sky Shirley from Brookline High School in Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Andy Mink, and I'm the Vice President for Education at the National Humanities Center. I'm joining you tonight from my home in Chapel Hill, um, just down the road from the center in Durham. Um, as many of you know, I recognize a lot of familiar names from our uh, attendees list tonight and our registration. Uh, as many of you know, uh, it's, it's an important function of webinars to ask for your participation and to do so through the chat box that's located in the bottom of the go to training control panel. Uh, take a moment now, in fact, and greet your, uh, your neighbor, uh, tell us where you're from, tell us um, what you teach, perhaps. Uh, this is the place where we're going to ask you to interact directly with our speakers. You can ask questions, you can uh, offer thoughts, you can respond to prompts that they may provide. You can also share resources and URLs and maybe even your own classroom experiences. Uh, for me, this is a really important part of, uh, of building this bridge of connecting new educators with Mike uh, Scott, or Sky Educator as well. It's it's a way to really encourage uh, a much more interactive experience. And the more you can contribute in that way, the better. If you do say something and, and it scrolls to the top or we don't quite get to it, please don't feel funny about typing in it again and making sure that you ping us. So that we and I'm fortunate to have uh, two speakers tonight, which means that one of them uh, will be able to, to linger in the chat room and respond to you directly there as well. The National Humanities Center is really pleased to, uh, to build bridges between research and scholarship and practice in classroom. And most of our activities in the education department really aim to put in conversation teachers and educators, researchers and scholars with compelling content. Uh, this is our 40th year. We have um, a primary focus of supporting humanities scholarship, but the extension and the implicit role in that is the value that it has in today's world and in today's classroom. We do this in a variety of ways. That includes a archive or repository of free and open materials. Uh, I encourage you to go to American Class and check out any one of the exemplar lessons and instructional materials that we've posted. Uh, these are meant to be suggestions. These are meant to be aspirational. These are meant to be guides. Um, I think you'll also find that these are meant to really start to expand. And while historically we've tended to work uh, primarily in the history and literature fields, as evidenced by tonight's webinar, we're really working to expand throughout the humanities disciplines and try to draw those connections between disciplines. We also have a webinar series that uh, has been very successful this year. I'm really pleased by the, the number of sold out sessions that we've had. I'm really pleased by how many repeat um, participants that I've seen and, and by the, the energy that seems to come from them. I think in large part that's because many of our topics are both curricular and extracurricular. What I mean by that is um, I, I certainly hope that the content we provide and we share is meaningful for the curriculum you teach, but I also hope that it is helpful uh, outside of the margins of your classroom, at the lunch table, uh, at bus duty, uh, talking to kids in the hallway. Uh, we've tried to focus on topics this year that really have a, a, a relevant um, and, and resonance with, uh, with all of us. And our suggestion, my suggestion, is that the humanities offer a blueprint it offers a map, it offers a guide on how to better understand the world we live in. And I'm uh, thankful that all of you have uh, made time to join us tonight. I think many of you might be on spring break, in fact, or at least preparing for next week's spring break. Um, and it's really that interaction that, uh, that we strive to. One of the ways we do this as well is to focus on the process of disciplines. And in fact, this is where I first met Mike and, and Sky and worked with them last summer, summer of 2018, when uh, we began a project that asked scholars and educators to begin to articulate the, the value and the role of individual humanities disciplines. The notion is that while the humanities in, at large has many common denominators or many things between disciplines that, uh, that, are, that are similar and approaches that, are, uh, that, that, that echo each other, we also wanted to recognize that each discipline has a very unique vocabulary, a very approach, a very unique background and set of resources. And this compilation, uh, Humanities in Class, How to Think and Learn in the Humanities, is our attempt to, uh, to bring that to life. So we focused on 10 different disciplines and uh, throughout the course of about eight months created a digital textbook compilation that asks each one of these disciplines to be really clear about the way they go about their work, the way that they think about research and scholarship, the way they think about teaching. And as you can see, there are uh, some 
um, some very interesting uh, disciplines that we were able to focus on. We were able to find both the differences and the similarities. And uh, as evidenced by tonight's webinar, our webinar on the classics chapter, um, I think we were able to, uh, to produce a final product that's helpful for both teachers and for students. Uh, this iBook is currently available in iTunes for free download. Um, I understand that that's a little bit proprietary if you don't have an Apple device, but uh, we felt that the interactivity and the media friendly uh, of the Apple technology really allowed us to display the full conversation between these disciplines. But we also have PDF versions. So if for some reason you're not on Apple and you'd like to get one of those, you can go to our website and download it. You'll miss some of the functionality and some of the hyper uh, activity of the technology, but it, it certainly is something that, um, that I hope is still valuable for you. And in fact, many of the pieces in that uh, iBook are meant to be able to be pulled out and shared uh, uh, separately. So that would include a podcast that we published last fall between myself, Mike, and Sky. This notion of how to think like a 21st century classicist was our focus. And this is a podcast that you can download and you can offer to your kids or you can uh, you can listen to yourself and maybe get a better sense of the kinds of uh, work that we'll do and, and think about tonight. I also want to mention that our Teachers Advisory Council it, uh, solicitation for new nominations and applications will be coming out after spring break, uh, early April. Um, we've been really pleased with uh, the dedication and the hard work of the 14 member Advisory Council this year. Uh, really some fantastic educators who have kept us grounded and made sure that the work we do is relevant and connected to the classroom. Uh, I see some of them in the uh, room with us tonight, including Jason uh, Chaconis down in uh, Miami-Dade. And I would love to have uh, any one of you apply and um, potentially be a part of this group for next year. Again, take a look uh, in the coming uh, week or so for that application process. At the end of tonight's session, you will have a chance to complete a survey and then download a certificate. And I heard the groan from many of you. Uh, this certificate sometimes is, is the one little glitch that we have in our system sometimes. And I, uh, I com commit to you and assure you that we will uh, rectify it if you, if you aren't able to find yours for some reason. Uh, the email seems to come out after I close the room. And so uh, once the room is closed, you can download that certificate. You can certainly email me uh, if, it, if it doesn't work out for some reason. Um, my colleague Libby Taylor will be back from maternity leave on Monday. I'm really happy to say and pleased to report. So we will absolutely get you what you need. So thank you for being patient with that um, and, and giving us a chance to work through some of the technical glitches with GoToTraining. Uh, so all that's an introduction uh, to why we're really here, which is to work with uh, Michael Fontaine and Sky Shirley on this this topic from democracy to author authoritarianism, uh, the death of the Roman Republic, and, and on, on face value, on first blush, you know, to my non-classics eye, this seems like um, you know this seems like a topic or a discipline even that uh, is, is a little far astray from my traditional humanities lens, and uh, it didn't take me long in working with Mike and Sky to really understand that. Uh, in terms of a blueprint for the world we live in, we can go back to these these ancient examples uh, and, and languages and, and disciplines and really get a strong, strong sense of perhaps what we're going through in, in our modern world. And I'm very pleased to um, uh, that, that both of them were able to join us and share their work. And I'd like to think that even if you don't teach Latin or if you don't teach an ancient language, if you don't teach classics, uh, you'll find a lot of uh, very clear connections with your own disciplines and your own curriculum. So, Mike, uh, I'm going to unmute you now, and I'm going to welcome you to the program. Hey, Mike, can you hear me? Mr. Ken, how you, how's everybody doing out there? Tell me Fantastic. in the text box. Mike, I'm also going to give you the mouse, and I'm going to give you the keys to the car, and I'm going to give you a, a, a credit card, and now we're yours. Thank you for joining us. Terrific. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is Mike Fontaine. Um, I know a few other names in the room, so it's exciting to see you. I hope to uh, get some comments and things from the rest of you in the text box, maybe make some new friends this evening. It's a real privilege to be with you. Um, tonight's topic, as you can see from the title, I'm, I'm interested in the change from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. And I got a ton of slides to show you, but I want to start, if I can get these to advance. Uh, let's see, is this work? There we go. I want to start by uh, just orienting you in space and time. So uh, Rome itself is a city. How many of you have been to Rome? Any of you gone on a vacation there, maybe study there for a short time or would like to go? <laughs> I see a few. <laughs> Terrific. 
Some of this is going to be really familiar to you. Never. Well, we'll get you there. Uh, terrific. There are direct flights from lots of places in the U.S. But uh, Italy, everybody knows, is shaped like a boot. It's kicking a three-cornered ball. A three-cornered ball is Sicily down there at the bottom. Rome is centrally located on the western side uh, of sort of the upper calf of, um, of the Italian peninsula. And what does it look like? That's what it starts off of. That's the city of Rome. But if you were to talk about Rome, the sense of the Roman Empire, take a look at what we are looking at. That's the Mediterranean Sea in the center. And the Roman Empire, at its largest extent in the year 117 under the Emperor Trajan, embraced. Uh, well, you can see Italy there sticking out a vast, huge amount of territory, starting up with uh, England all the way down to the Sahara Desert, all the way across to Iraq. Uh, and then uh, all these territories around there, uh, some of these they gave up right away. But one point I'd like to make on you right away, uh, impress on you right away is that Rome is a Mediterranean empire. It's not a European empire in the way a lot of people seem to think. North Africa and the Middle East are some of the most important parts of the Roman Empire. Germany was never really a part of it, except for a couple bits in the south. Uh, Scandinavia, Central Europe, Russia, none of that was part of the Roman Empire. Whereas, as I say, Egypt always was. Uh, Israel, Turkey, uh, these places. Uh, so the question that we want to look at, let's, sorry, I'm having a little trouble. There we go. Uh, is how we get to that part. So let's look at the city of Rome. I want to orient you in the actual city. If you've been there, uh, you know what this is, what you're looking at right here. That is St. Peter's Church in Rome, also called the Vatican colloquially. And uh, it's one of the most famous sites. There's a bridge going across the Tiber River. That's the main river that takes you through Rome. If you were to climb the dome of St. Peter's and look out, this is what you would see. So we were staring through Michelangelo's piazza, straight down a street that would run into the river. And if you were to walk down that river, starting out at St. Peter's, you would soon come to this. This is called Castel San Angelo. Uh, but it's not really, it didn't become a castle until the Middle Ages. This is in fact the tomb of the Emperor Hadrian, who was the successor of the guy uh, Trajan, who held the Roman Empire at its largest extent. So you're looking at a tomb that's about 1900 years old, turned into a castle in the Middle Ages. Now, if you were to walk across this bridge, which has statues by Bernini, uh, and you keep walking, eventually you get to this building. Tell me in the comments if you have any idea what we're looking at. Some of you must surely know what this is. And you can give them a moment, Mike, and folks will start. You can imagine their fingers poised over the, the keyboard. Ah, there we go. The answers are rolling in. The Pantheon, the Pantheon, the Pantheon. Brilliant. Right. It says right there on the front in sort of strange Latin that Marcus Agrippa made this when he was consul for the third time. This was built under that same emperor, Hadrian, uh, even though it attributes it to somebody else long in the past. You walk inside. Everybody does this. You look up. You see the famous rotunda ceiling, which has the opening called the oculus, the eye in Latin, that is open to the... Um, to the elements, it's made out of cement. Uh, it's one of the great feats of Roman engineering going back 1900 years, still standing. It was the largest dome in Rome until St. Peter's dome itself was built. So let's say you walk out, you go down the street, uh, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile and you run into this. What's this, anybody know what we're looking at? People come here, they throw a coin in and if you do, they say you're gonna come back. Trevi Fountain, look at that. Terrific. So this is Renaissance Baroque, a little bit later than Renaissance Baroque. Um, but if you were to keep walking down the street, you'll see this. This is the column of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, it's one of two columns, a little less famous than the other one. Uh, and if you were to keep walking down the street and take a left, you would run into this. This is a triumphal arch that leads you into the Roman Forum from one end. And if you were to walk into that, you'd see on the side on one of the panels, this famous image. What do you think we're looking at? The sack of Jerusalem, very good, Sam. Yeah, so uh, right in time for Passover, uh, you can see the famous Jewish menorah. This is the triumphal arch of Titus that commemorates the Roman sack of the second, the second temple in Jerusalem in the year 70. And that tells you uh, quite a bit about the, the origins of the Jewish diaspora from that moment. 
Good. You keep walking. This is the Roman Forum. You see an even bigger triumphal arch by the African Emperor Severus. If you walk down the street, you see this famous thing. I'm not going to ask you because I know you all know that's the Colosseum. Uh, that's what it looks like today. Uh, this is it at night, but uh, and a couple other images. But this is what it would have looked like in antiquity. So I'm going to show you some reconstructions now. A really spectacular uh, sports stadium. Uh, it had uh, an awning that could be extended in the elements. And now this is a model of what Rome would have looked like at its height. This is from a museum in the south of Rome that was built by the fascists to educate school children on what uh, ancient Rome looked like. This gigantic race course that you're looking at off to the left is uh, the race course of Domitian. It's today Piazza Navona, or as one of the more famous spots in Rome. Uh, that wall looking thing in red, any idea what that is that's snaking up through the city? Aqueduct, very good. Well, you guys are fast. Terrific. So that's how the Romans got their water, through these aqueducts. Uh, that is where the Pantheon was originally, or so we think. This is a reconstruction. And this here is the uh, Theater of Pompey, which is today near Largo, Argentina. I'll come back to this later on when I talk about the assassination of Julius Caesar. It was the first theater. This is where you would go to watch comedies or tragedies. If any of you have ever heard of Plautus or Terence, this is where those plays were performed. Okay, so we're going to scroll back and look at some more pictures of Rome. You see the Tiber River snaking through. And I want to show you what everyday life would look like. Take a look at these pictures. These are fantastic reconstructions. 2,000 years ago, this is how people lived in Rome, in apartment buildings, more or less exactly the same as they live in in Rome today. Or if you go down to Naples, you see this kind of architecture even more clearly. It's exactly the same. They still live the same way. The Romans called these apartment buildings insulae, sort of islands is the idea, in the sea of, of streets. Uh, here's the aqueduct, shows you the buildings. Uh, again, some more of how dense the city was. We don't really know the population, but we have different guesses. Uh, and again, this is what Rome looked like at its height, the Roman Empire. So I've been showing you pictures of the city of Rome, but all of this was under a single territorial control. Uh, at its extent, what is this? Anybody got a good idea? Uh, somebody mentions the plumbing they had back then. The Romans had flush toilets, which is pretty interesting. Uh, they didn't do outhouses. Hadrian's Wall, very good. Hadrian's Wall. Walls are in the news all the time now. Uh, and the Romans built this one to keep the Scots out. Okay, so when was all this stuff built? If you know Roman history, you're going to say right away 2,000 years ago. But have a look at what happened to Rome. These are prints that were drawn by an artist named Piranesi about 350 years ago in Rome. It says in Italian down below, this is a view of the cow field. This is what the Roman Forum looked like in uh, his time, 350 years ago. The whole Roman Forum had filled in with dirt it had, and people were grazing animals there. Hey, Mike, let me um, ask you a quick question. Sure. Um, and I'm sorry, I meant to insert this right before you sort of switched from place to time. But, you know, in terms of, of unpacking how you think about this, you know, you oriented tonight's webinar by focusing on uh, place and geography and yeah. landscape and giving us a, a short little walkthrough. Tell, tell me why that's so important to you. Why, why did you start with place? Because I want to give people a real clear sense of what life was like back then. Life was really, really sophisticated 2,000 years ago. The material conditions of life in ancient Rome were as good as they were until the American Civil War, about 150 years ago, especially for medicine and pain control. Um, but as I said, they had flush toilets. They had granite countertops. They lived in apartments, more or less, as you would see today. And a lot of people watch movies like Braveheart or stuff about the Middle Ages. And it's hard to appreciate that life got considerably worse uh, when Rome broke apart and the supply lines were cut and there were various um, political upheavals. And that's why I think it's important to, to just get a sense of if you had been in Rome back then, what would it have been like to live then? Um, right. And, and the implication then is regardless of what age you teach, what grade you might teach, that that's an important first step to having today's student really uh, start to wrap their brain around this. Yeah, thanks, Andy. You make a really good point. It's uh, I've taught Latin for a number of years, Roman history for a number of years, and people often, it's all abstract. Until you go there, uh, it doesn't really hit home that this stuff is real. These were real people. So I see a question here. I'm going to try and 
take a quick peek at this. It says, are, they, are these conditions were the case for people of all classes? No, absolutely not. No, 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 I should be clear about that. Uh, the middle classes did live better lives back then than uh, they did in much later periods, but Rome had probably seven slaves to every free person. You can never ever forget that. Women did have a greater degree of freedom in classical Rome than they did in most periods of European history. Uh, but they certainly didn't have anything like equal rights. Uh, and so slaves had a variety of conditions and peasants had a variety of conditions. And in fact, I should probably hasten on to get to that point now. So yep. let me pull Thank up you. some. Yep. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. I'm just showing you some more uh, images of everything falling apart. Uh, where did Rome come from? Where did it go? Have a look at this animation, folks. I'm starting you in the, look at the years. We're going from the BC years. We're going forward in time, and I'm going to put in the chat the link where you can get this if you're interested. So we're looking at the Mediterranean Sea, and Rome is swallowing up territory and growing into its empire. We're now in the CE years, AD years, if you prefer. We're getting up to the year 300. Now watch what's about to happen here. 360, boom. Something interesting happens. It splits into the east and the west, and now it's getting smaller. Totally gone in the, in the west. And it goes on. I'm going to just run it one more time. It starts in that little dot there where Rome is. It's going over Italy. As you get to about the, the third century BC, it's getting bigger, pushing up into France, southern Spain. Now it's going to take in a minute North Africa. There goes the conquest of, of Gaul, of France. There's Egypt, the Middle East, swallowed up. So you can see Rome growing over the years. This uh, administration or empire, whatever you want to call it, lasted for a long time. I don't want to start at the beginning. I want to start at this particular moment. Have a look at this. This is the year 380 AD. This is a Roman emperor here on the right. He issued an edict, and I'd like to read it with you. So now you have the Roman emperor, who is the sole sort of monarch in power. And he says, this is an edict to the people of Constantinople or Istanbul. He says, it is our desire, look at how they talk. It is our desire that all the various nations which are subject to our clemency should continue to profess that religion which was delivered to the Romans by the divine apostle Peter. Let us believe, let us believe in the one deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in equal majesty and in a holy trinity. As for the others, since in our judgments, judgment they are foolish madmen, we declare that they shall be branded with the ignominious name of heretics. They will suffer the punishment of our authority, which in accordance with the will of heaven, we shall decide to inflict. So I would like to suggest to you, how do we get to this point? This is a watershed moment in Western civilization, this year 380, this edict. Why? Because the government did more with this than just unite the church and state, Rome with uh, Christianity. It mandated a belief. This was the government telling you you had to believe a theological proposition under penalty of law, or you were going to have to pay a fine or something like that. Now, this action was not reversed until the Enlightenment into the 18th, in the 18th century. If you think of Voltaire, this is when uh, the power of the church began to decline. So you're looking at about 1,500 years that this edict more or less exercises power. So what came before this? So the Roman Empire starts with this one guy, Augustus Caesar, Rome's first imperator. That's a Latin word. Uh, and originally it means commander in chief. Uh, over time, it becomes the word emperor. Those are his dates, 63 BC to 14 AD. So before Augustus, Rome was a republic with many politicians. And I know it's a word many of us aren't even using in political discourse today. We have a bit of a problem with our language. We always talk about democracy in the US, which is not really what we have. Uh, we have a republic, but it gets confusing. So I'll get into this a little bit. Rome was a republic with many different politicians. After Augustus, those politicians all remained, but they didn't have any power anymore. They all took their orders from him. And those politicians never got their power back after that. Uh, this is the Battle of Actium, 31 BC, another watershed moment, a famous depiction. Take a look just at the technology they fought this water battle with. These massive ships that look like Spanish galleys. Uh, the Augustan age of Rome is considered sort of the golden age of Rome. So calling himself in Latin the princeps, Augustus is Rome's very first emperor. So princeps means the leader. Augustus ends a century of civil wars that have been fought up to that time, and he ushers in the so-called golden age, a renaissance of literature and art. 
and construction. That Augustan age is dated 43 BC to 18 AD. Uh, and Augustus ruled for 40 years. The interesting thing is he never called himself the emperor. Uh, he always maintained, some people think this was sort of a secret, he always maintained the pretense of Republican rule. That is to say, he always pretended as though he'd simply restored the Republic or just he kept the Republic going. By the way, these statues we have today in the Vatican are all in white and different museums. But in antiquity, we think they were painted, probably not as gaudy as the one on the right, uh, but something closer to that than what you see on the left here. Uh, okay, just to get your orientation in space again, I can skip over that. Uh, Augustus inscribed his, uh, his great achievements all around the empire. You'll see a copy of this today. If you go to Rome and go see the Arapacus. Uh, he had a tomb built for himself. So this is a Roman politician who built the first tomb, the mausoleum of Augustus. It's mostly destroyed today, but it looked virtually like the Castle San Angelo, which is modeled on the tomb of Augustus. So this is a politician who did these things. I asked you to read for this uh, a section from Tacitus. And Tacitus, when he decides to write the history of the Roman Empire, he doesn't start with Augustus. He starts with Tiberius. Tiberius is the second Roman emperor. And he's interested in the, tra in the transition. So after Augustus had ruled for 40 years, uh, Tiberius, uh, or rather, the, uh, people didn't know what to do. They said, wow, this guy's been in power for 40 years. It's kind of like Fidel Castro. What are we going to do after this guy's been around so long? Uh, so in Rome, when he died, the senators were too afraid or they were too eager to oppose Tiberius. That's what Tacitus says. Uh, let me get my next point. There we go. Tiberius did something very shrewd. He has Augustus proclaimed a god which sounds a little funny to students. I often compare it to the saints in the Roman Catholic Church. Italy has a long tradition of uh, doing this when they die, sort of proclaiming divine honors of various kinds. It had been going on in Rome for a long time, but it, was a, it seemed like an absurd anachronism to do this. But he stood in front of the Senate and he says, look, I'm the heir apparent here. Who disagrees that this man was a god? And everybody was too afraid to disagree. So Tiberius then sees that he can consolidate power. He starts to purge his enemies or his opposition, and he establishes a permanent military bodyguard. Uh, provinces of the Roman Empire, when Augustus died, tried to secede, but Tiberius crushed them militarily. So they went in and they disallowed provinces from breaking away. Uh, as you might imagine, free speech begins to decline almost immediately. And eventually Tiberius and his successors establish a secret police to spy on Roman citizens. Uh, we also see the Roman uh, the Roman practice. Uh, you may know this phrase. I bet most of you know this phrase, "damnatio memoria," to condemn the memory of somebody. Uh, and you see this in totalitarian states. You saw it in the Soviet Union. You would literally disappear a person from the record. Uh, if it were an inscription, you chisel it out. Uh, if it was a person's face, this was one of the imperial princes. You just scrape right over the face. So. Uh, this is what the Praetorian Guard looked like. Tiberius establishes a military secret service. So now these guys start to work for uh, the politicians, uh, and they're drawn from the military rather than uh, private service. Here are some pictures of it. Um, you also start to get with Tiberius' successors uh, about a generation later. You get Nero, who's kind of famous. They begin building houses that look like this. Nero built something called the Golden House, the Domus Aurea. Now look at that, that's a private residence. Uh, it might remind you of Saddam Hussein's palaces in Iraq. When the United States invaded Iraq, Saddam Hussein was famous for having a half dozen of these kinds of houses scattered around. People went in, they took pictures. And so this is the kind of thing you see in authoritarian regimes a lot today. Here's a reconstruction of what it looked like inside the Golden House, very, very ornate. Um, you see on the left here is a colossal statue that Nero had built of himself to commemorate himself. Again, uh, statues of the, uh, are, are, or portraits are a sign of authoritarian control. I saw this in certain countries when I traveled around about a dozen years ago. Um, they put these statues up everywhere to remind you who's keeping an eye on you. Again, you might compare these colossal statues of Saddam Hussein that were all over Iraq when he was still in power, these massive statues set up. So the question is, what became before Augustus and what made him possible? How do you get to the state where people lose control of their liberties 
and they're all answerable to one person. So I said Augustus was Rome's first emperor, and technically that is true, but in reality it's not. And this is a hugely important point. It's because for nearly 200 years before Augustus, the Roman so-called Republic had been an imperial republic. This is a term that's worth remembering. That is to say, Rome was a republic that governed an empire, but they used republican institutions, or you might even say democratic institutions. So to explain that, I want to go further back to the very, very beginning. Here's Rome in Italy. In the beginning, it's just this little dinky river. You can see where Rome is, the Tiber River. And it started off just like this. If you've ever been to Ithaca, you've been to our farmer's market. That's a picture of it to the left. Rome started off as a farmer's market, or, or uh, to be more precise, as a cattle market. And this is in the year 753 BC. People settled there because the Tiber River goes on for a while, but there's a little island in the center of Rome, and it's the easiest place to cross over. Uh, so it was great for people trading cattle with people on the other side of the river. Uh, it's not far away from the famous picture you see there, the Boca della Verita. For the first uh, 250 years or so, 240 years, Rome had kings as their government. So again, that's about as long as we are from the adoption of the Constitution in the United States. It had kings like most other uh, states back then. What's unusual is that the city was populated by immigrants from other communities. It was, or it saw itself as a meritocracy where immigrants could really rise in, rise up through the ranks and achieve great things. And some of their kings, uh, at least according to legend, were, uh, they benefited from the system. Rome's last king was a nasty guy named Tarquinius Superbus. Uh, tell me if you know what Superbus means. Type it in the message box there. Uh, because you've got to be careful. In English, it sounds like it means Tarquinius the awesome guy. But in Latin, it doesn't mean awesome. Superbus means, what do you think? The proud, yeah. Proud in the bad, arrogant, arrogant, yes. The obnoxious, the arrogant. Well, he had a bozo of a son named Sextus Tarquinius who was raised at, to be the next king. And this kid, as you might imagine, abused his power. So the Romans had a legend that there was a noble woman named Lucretia. And this guy, Sextus Tarquinius, one day, simply because he could, decided to uh, steal into Lucretia's house and rape her. Uh, and so this is a famous episode, the rape of Lucretia. Tarquinius assaults her. And then when she leaves, her husband comes home and she says, you're never going to believe what I've done uh, or what's happened to me. And, uh, and her family all says, no, 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 that's not uh, nothing you did. You didn't do anything wrong. And she says, well, I would never want another Roman woman to use me as an example of being unfaithful. So she pulls out a dagger and kills herself. Uh, this is a famous foundational moment in Roman history. Some people think it's just a made up story to explain that uh, the monarchy when it devolved was a form of rape of the citizens that is say it was an abuse of power nevertheless it's a very powerful motif according to the story uh the aristocrats rise up and they expel the kings and so this guy brutus a guy named lucius junius brutus becomes rome's first consul in the year 509 bc now in the united states we have two pres we have one president and one vice president but in ancient rome they had two consuls basically two presidents this is the act that creates the roman Republic. So the Roman Republic dates from the year 509 BC. That act is famously commemorated. You can see books here. Uh, John Wilkes Booth regarded himself as the American Brutus. He thought Lincoln was a tyrant. Over here on the left, anybody know who that, uh, on the right, anybody know who this woman is on the right? My, I asked my wife. She knew right away, which was, I thought, quite impressive. Well, that's Lucretia Mott. She's a very, very important suffragette, uh, uh, suffragist in the United States. Uh, and it, interesting to see that these names live on as personal names. So the Latin word res publica or republic means power of the people or the people's state. You could also translate it commonwealth or democracy, which is simply the Greek word for power of the people. In some cases, it seems to be translating the Greek word. So this republic lasts for nearly 500 years, an extremely stable system. In that time, people had the freedom of speech, the freedom of movement, freedom of conscience. You could believe anything you wanted. There were free markets to trade their goods. There was a single currency that you could spend all around the area. There were competitive annual elections. So if you think competition is a good thing in politics, this is what is going to be of greatest interest to you. 
And most famously, the Roman Republic was marked by checks and balances. I asked you to read Polybius, this passage from Polybius. So Polybius was a Greek uh, aristocrat who was brought to Rome as sort of a hostage, but he was uh, impressed by the Roman system and he wound up writing a history of Rome in the second century BC. And he says, boy, you know, this is really kind of an interesting government they have here. He says, you've got this sort of executive branch and you've got this legislative branch and you've got this judicial system. And he says, it prevents this idea of anacyclosis or circularity. Uh, anacyclosis is just a fancy Greek words that, like bicycle, you can see the root is the same. Uh, means it's going to cycle up and around again. And uh, this is an ancient Greek idea that all governments decline and they get worse over time. And the only way you're going to prevent all the power being concentrated in the hands of a few people and then one person is to balance and check the system. And so this is usually of great interest to your students. They're going to want to be interested in this. It's important to recognize that the Roman system of checks and balances does not code on to the American system exactly. And sometimes the differences are at least as important as the, uh, as the similarities, but still, it's a pretty interesting idea. I think I see a question. Freedom of conscience, but for all but the heretics. Now, that's important. It's a good question. There were no heretics in ancient Rome. Uh, that idea just wouldn't make any sense to them. There was great toleration for religion. Uh, the, in what sense was the state sponsor? Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, Sam asked, in what sense was the state sponsor of religion? Rome enforced. Rome didn't really enforce it uh, until Christianity gets started, and that's when it starts to cause problems. But in the Republic, uh, it doesn't cause any problems at all. The only one that it theoretically did was with Judaism, but Rome, uh, being very practical, gave uh, Jews a legal exemption to practice their own religion in their own characteristic way. So let me get back to the, the bit here. The balance of powers, I mentioned this. Uh, okay, the Imperial Republic goes on. So I don't want to make it sound like Rome was some utopia that you'd want to live in, like it was this wondrous, exotic place. Students always say, would you want to live there? I say, no, not at all. I probably would have been one of the slaves. But beyond that, the state started conquering its neighbors, especially in the third century BC. Uh, so Rome, uh, as it starts to expand, it soon swallows up Italy, and then Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, the islands all around it. Um, So Rome, as it begins expanding, it comes into conflict with its Mediterranean neighbor, the Carthaginian Empire. Take a look. Um, oh, and let me make this point. It was a bipolar world with two superpowers. So as Rome expands in all the colored bits that you're looking at here, it's going to come into conflict with all the purple that you're looking at down here. And uh, if you can see where Rome is, Virgil makes this point. It's more or less facing Carthage at the choke point of the Mediterranean. If you're trying to go from east to west, you've got to get between Sicily and Carthage. And so this is the, you can, Rome and Carthage were almost destined to fight each other. So it's a bipolar world. You've got these two massive empires. It's going to remind you of the Cold War. And the United States was facing down the Soviet Union and all the states all around the world were lining up against each other. This is just a map to help you remember uh, what things were like, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, Rome fought three massive wars against Carthage. These were the largest wars in history at that time, and they may be the largest wars in history until the modern period. The first huge war was a naval invasion. Rome invaded uh, North Africa, uh, and it fought for, what? what is that, 25 years. The second war was against Hannibal, and the third war, Rome destroys Carthage forever, blots out its enemies. What's interesting about the second war is that it was fought in Italy. Rome was nearly destroyed, but uh, this is an episode everybody's familiar with. Hannibal invaded Italy on top of war elephants. He got these elephants to cross the Alps. He went over from Spain and marched down the peninsula. So there were problems on the horizon. After Rome defeats Carthage in that last war in 146, Rome becomes the hegemon of a unipolar world. It's the only supreme power left in the world. Nobody can challenge it. And so by the middle of the first century AD, uh, call it 200 years later, Rome had swallowed up Spain, France, Greece, North Africa, and the whole Middle East. Take a look at this map yet again. So Rome had been our little village here, but now it's got this humongous empire. That's just in 44 BC. This is where the problems come in. All that expansion adds a lot of arable land, land that you can farm, good land. 
So Rome starts to set up new colonies in some places, but it turns other territories into provinces. Here's the problem. Rome begins to govern these provinces, but they're still using the same traditional political institutions that they had devised for the Republic. Remember, Rome was basically a farmer's market, little tiny city the size of Ithaca, New York. And they're trying to govern this gigantic bloated empire using village politics. So one of their responses was Rome starts to increase the size of its army massively to deal with discontent on its borders, people trying to push in or out of the empire. Here you'll recognize uh, slaves in chains. This is going to be a huge crucial point to keep in mind. Hey, Mike, let, let me ask you a quick question, if you don't mind. Um, tell me about communications. Tell me about how quickly information moved and how uh, quickly realizations were made. Yeah, it's a good, really good question. Uh, it was fast by uh, the standards of the time. You could send a letter anywhere in the Roman Empire. It would get there in two weeks. Uh, I don't know how they did it, some kind of Pony Express or something like that. It's not something I've studied, but communications were excellent. And there's all kinds of movement all around the Roman Empire. Um, even if you in the second or third centuries BC, we hear about a huge number of Italians living in North Africa. We hear about Italians trading all throughout the Persian Empire, which was on the eastern border. So people were moving all around, uh, and communications were pretty slow. The focus here, though, why Rome starts to fall apart is if we if we look back to Italy, uh, when Rome defeated Carthage, what you would traditionally do in a war like that is you would kill most of the men of fighting age, of fighting age and you would enslave the women, the children, and a lot of the other men. This is exactly what the Romans did. So they bring into Italy a gigantic number of slaves. Now, these slaves, uh, in a way, from the native Italian peasants' point of view, are going to be comparable to undocumented immigration. That is to say, your elites are bringing in uh, competition for your wages that you can't compete with. You can't compete with free. Uh, labor. Now, obviously, it looks very different from the point of view of the slaves, but what this does is it gives rise to these populist politicians in the time of the Republic who say, these uh, elites, they're not paying any attention to us, they're stealing all our jobs, they're stealing all the uh, wealth, and they're concentrating it in the hands of just a few people. Uh, this is what Appian wrote about. If you read these texts, uh, I encourage you to bring them into your classes because the speeches could be ripped straight from the headlines of the rhetoric we're seeing today. Uh, and so, uh, as Appian told us, these politicians, uh, the Gracchi brothers, they try to find solutions to uh, ease the pain, the economic pain on the native Italian peasants, but they are clubbed to death in the streets, murdered uh, by the aristocrats. And so, uh, instead of any kind of reform that might have alleviated the pressure, what happens is it legitimates political violence. And suddenly you see, it's almost like pulling the cork out of a bottle. You see rapid deterioration in the decades that follow. Immediately these various civil wars start to break out. Uh, and then we start to see proscriptions, I'll talk about this word in a second, under this guy Sulla, another politician who names himself Dictator, the dictator, uh, which had originally been uh, a title you give somebody in a time of crisis, but he held on to it much longer than he was supposed to. That precedent inspires a guy named Julius Caesar, uh, but my, the names are less important than the, the impression I want to make is we start seeing a series of strongmen who team up in various constellations called hun, uh, that are like juntas. They call them triumvirates, groups of three guys. Proscriptions were this frightening phenomenon where uh, the government would write your name on a sheet of paper, tack it up downtown in the middle of the village square, and if your name was on there, you could be legally killed and somebody could collect a bounty for killing you. So all kinds of people were purged. Julius Caesar, uh, coming at the tail end of all these things, he's famous for conquering Gaul, that is say France, and bringing it into the empire. But he's another strong man who teams up. Uh, there's a bunch of rapidly shifting alliances, and he defeats his rivals, and he has himself named dictator forever and ever and ever, dictator perpetual. As you all know, on March 15th, he was assassinated by a group of senators who say this guy is getting too powerful. The only way to stop him is to kill him. They were led by a guy who was also named Brutus, uh, who made much of the fact that he shared a name with the guy in 509 BC. Caesar had crossed the Rubicon. Uh, after he was killed, there was propaganda minted, uh, coins minted to commemorate this act of what they called liberation, 
of freeing people from Caesar's tyranny. This is shown in a lot of artworks. Uh, let me skip over Cicero here. What happens again, the people who call themselves the liberators, the people who murdered Caesar, they immediately uh, go to war with some other people that want to make a claim on Caesar's influence. And all these people start killing each other, and making war on each other, and it gets really confusing, unless you're a specialist. But it winds up in the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, where Octavian, a guy named Octavian, Caesar's nephew, defeats Mark Antony and his lover Cleopatra. This is the stuff of the movies. Uh, Octavian brings Egypt into the empire, and he gets back to Rome, and they, everyone hails him as Augustus, the August one, the reverend one. The reverend, I guess you could say. And that date of 27 marks the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire. So what I've tried to do is bring you back to uh, my last starting point. In other words, this Battle of Actium, we've gone from a republic to an empire under this one guy. And it's when he died that the freedoms didn't go away. Let me skip over this. Uh, I, I told you that Augustus never called himself the emperor. He called himself the leader. Anybody recognize these other people who all call themselves the leader in their various languages? I'm sure you know the guy on the left. Yeah, there's Mao. Very good. Called himself the leader. Everybody recognizes, I assume, Hitler on the left. Yep, good, good. There you go. We got them all. These guys, well, not, uh, especially Hitler, Mussolini, and Mao, they all call themselves the leader. So you want to think about Augustus in those terms, like one of these guys, at least by his rhetoric. You might be a little afraid to oppose somebody like that. All right, I want to get to the first major analysis of the breakdown and how all this stuff happened. What I want to do is also share a, a link to a, uh, a new translation I'm going to mention here, if you're interested. Uh, let me get back to, whoops. Okay, the first major analyst of the breakdown was a guy, a Roman historian named Salus. This is a a fantastic new translation. He's a historian and he says, how did we get to this point? Well, here are the steps that he thought leads to an irreversible breakdown from a democracy to the start of an authoritarian state. He says total success in that war against Carthage in 146 BC, when we won and we defeated our greatest rival, it gave us ownership of new land and people. So he says our greatest movement, our greatest moment politically and militarily what carried within it the seeds of our own destruction. Why? Because uh, as we conquered all the new land and people, the influx of cheap foreign labor totally ruined our native peasants. It ruined our native economy. So the government response was to empower big corporations to farm all this public land on contracts. Uh, and when the, these corporations employed slaves rather than native uh, citizens to do it, you get the rise of these populist leaders who promised economic relief. Those are those speeches in Appian that I mentioned, the Gracchi brothers. Those leaders, the Gracchi, they get assassinated by the elites who resist any kind of relief. And so this, Salas harps on this point, it legitimizes political violence. And legitimizing political violence gives rise in turn for the creation of paramilitary groups. These politicians start teaming up with people who say, look, I need protection. Can you guys get together some weapons and, and protect me? Uh, and they do. So uh, these politicians become sort of strong men in the, in the kind that we're seeing rise arguably in the world today. They're surrounded by tough guys with guns or weapons. All this political violence sparks a civil war eventually. And so you start seeing these legal fictions, the so-called restoration of politics the way it used to be, but without any real power. People are so sick and tired, but the average person is so sick and tired of all this violence and fear that they voluntarily surrender all their civil liberties for the promise of security. The second major analyst of the breakdown is Tacitus, uh, who I also asked you to read. Tacitus, again, harps on that theme. He says, people have surrendered their civil liberties for the promise of security. Not that they actually get it. He also emphasizes that the establishment of a permanent military bodyguard at home was a mistake that made it uh, almost impossible to reverse. When you have empowered the military to muster within your borders and to carry weapons, the average person can't resist them. He says that's responsible for curtailing the average person's freedoms. And that's how you start consolidating powers 
before long, you don't see competitive elections anymore. You see hereditary succession. And after a generation or two, he says, people can't even remember what freedom was. You know, if you're 20, 30 years old and you're Augustus has been ruling for 35 years, you don't even know what freedom could be. He says, and then there's endless foreign wars. Rome is fighting these endless foreign wars on its borders, keeps people occupied. Uh, oh, I think it's running a bit slow here. I've got just a couple more points. The other analysis is a guy named Juvenal. He was a satirist, and he famously said, if you give people bread and circuses, they ain't never gonna revolt. And so what does he mean by food? Well, the Romans actually literally gave out food, bread, uh, and they also gave them those professional sports, the gladiators. Uh, but I want to make the point, you see this a lot, people often, they love that phrase bread and circuses, and you'll see it in political, uh, you will see this in political propaganda, political points, political op-eds, cartoons all the time. So today we don't get food, we get food stamps. Certain politicians give away more than others. Uh, and so you see caricatures like this. On the left, you can see bread. On the right, MTV, circuses. And this is true of every politician. Uh, I just pulled together a few images with Trump v. Clinton. Arguably, one gives you bread, the other gives you a circus. Uh, this is a recent political cartoon. Are you not entertained? This is a meme drawn from the movie Gladiator with Trump uh, the clown nose. Uh, so I want to skip over these slides uh, and simply make the point that all those famous pictures I showed you, paradoxically, are from the time of the Roman Empire, when you arguably had less freedom than you ever had before. And that sounds great uh, to have this nice system while Rome is still expanded. But Roman historians like to concentrate on something called the crisis of the third century. Hey, hey Mike, what can I interrupt? Mike, I, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a question. I, I also want to let you know that we're doing really well with time, so don't feel uh, rushed at all. Um, oh, all right. but but you know, I I do want to ask you to maybe linger a little bit on this connection you just made, and I and I think, you know, they're they're so obvious in some ways, but I wonder if kids that you teach at Cornell, if the kids that our participants tonight uh, work with, if if those kinds of connections are as explicit as they as they seem. So even a phrase like bread and circus, even uh, political cartoons, the ways in which you just tied it just so effortlessly, it almost was dismissive, uh, you know, how quickly, how easily it is to tie that to modern political discourse. But pause there just for a second for me and, and maybe, maybe bring that point forward just a little bit more. Um, Thanks. How, how, do you see, how do you see that as a self-referencing you know, as an echo from 2,000 years ago. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy. I, you're right. It's hard to know what we take for granted and what we don't. Uh, so, yeah, let's go back. I just pulled that slide back up. Uh, this is a really profound analysis. Uh, that Juvenal was sort of harping on timeless problems of his time. And he says, you know, human beings, they aren't really all that different. You know, your generations rise and fall, but people – our behavior is more or less the same and our foibles and our failings are more or less the same and politicians know that. And so if you don't have a lot of money and you're not doing that well and a politician comes along and offers you a tax break or offers you food stamps or subsidized housing and so you you got to wonder I mean how much do we really care about foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis, I don't know Iran or China or North Korea the average person is just trying to get by so in electoral politics, this is a perennial winner. You give people food. I mean, that's, that's uh, a really, that, Mike, that's a fundamental thing you just said, because I would imagine that, you know, the, the names that you've been saying tonight, the, the places you seem to most kids, younger students, this is long ago and far away. And they, they probably don't, it's probably very difficult for them to acknowledge that humans are humans, politics is politics, and that basic function you just described hasn't changed in several millennia. I mean, that's a that's a really critical point, I would imagine, for a room full of students. Oh, thank you, Andy. Yeah, so let me, I guess, think a bit about that. We are in a political era right now, as I read the news, where people are eager to emphasize difference among uh, people and different groups of people. And there's probably a, a great deal of merit in that. Uh, but of course, the more you emphasize the differences, the less you can see the similarities. 
Uh, and so this is a uh, something we always kick around in classics. Do we emphasize the difference or the similarities? I'm one of these people, I think, looking for the similarities helps us understand some of the problems we have today and how to see through some of the illusions uh, or the propaganda that people have. But it's not, of course, always propaganda. There might really be some reason to give people food. If you're in charge and you have surplus food or you have extra money, there's a real argument to be made. Say, there's no reason for people in our country to be going hungry if they don't have to. So, so this what, is a great, yeah. you, you, you can know, bring in your class. You know, what's interesting about what you just said too, is if you look at North Korea, they don't, that, you know, that leader doesn't seem to understand the basic fundamental ancient history lesson you just said. Um, you have to feed people. You have to make sure that they have food. And, and in North Korea, of course, uh, they, they've experienced famine. So it's a really interesting, like you just layered that onto 2017 and 18 effortlessly. <laughs> oh, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I mean, you, you make a terrific point. Uh, in North Korea, another example, if I don't know, uh, of course, uh, many of our participants, I think, are, are younger. So maybe this is going too far back. But Zimbabwe, uh, why, 20 years ago, Zimbabwe was regarded as this fantastic exporter of food all around the place. An, an amazing economy. And then uh, very much as in ancient Rome, uh, Robert Mugabe came in and he said, we're going to expropriate, that is say, take away by government order uh, farms from a number of people that have had them in their families for many generations. And in his case, uh, it was because Zimbabwe had been colonized by uh, the British and he was kicking white farmers off on a racial basis to give the land away to native uh, black farmers. Now, there's certainly an argument to be made for doing that. Or for not doing that, and that's something uh, there was a, many, many people debated at the time. But what has happened is that Zimbabwe experienced hyperinflation, complete foreign disinvestment, and the economy is in a total shambles. And Robert Mugabe is still in charge after 20 years. They used to have electoral politics. So Zimbabwe in, uh, is very much, in in some respects, uh, Rome redux 2,000 years later. Um, and so these political cartoons, let me just pull one up here. Uh, they can be really great think pieces for your students. Uh, this one is a great one uh, because uh, the circuses that juveniles say, look at this, MTV. I realize already this is quaint. This is probably when Obama was his first election or something like that. But you can see the iconography. He's depicted as a Roman emperor uh, wearing the traditional laurel leaves in his hair. Uh, but MTV, I, I'm not really exactly sure what that cartoon looking thing is there. but uh, do you, can anybody see what it says back behind that purple hair? What is that the logo of? Oh, right, there we go. Tyler Imbrex says Lady Gaga. Okay, see, that tells you what I know about pop culture. I don't know. Good American Idol, exactly. These kind of shows. These shows are exactly what people want to watch. And anytime this stuff is on TV and you're watching basically a talent competition, you say, what are we not watching? Uh, and in today's politics, Twitter, more than any other platform, has shown us what a circus can do. People put out a tweet. Everybody gets emotional. So, oh, ooh, I'm going to get all bent out of shape about the latest indignity or outrage or this or that. And the question is, the people who are putting that out there, what are they not doing? What are they distracting you from? Is anybody reading the bills in Washington uh, that are being passed or not being passed? And so this stuff is all kind of a distraction. Uh, but again, you know, the average person, they like that stuff. It's entertaining. Here's, uh, let me pull up the Trump one just to give you, uh, the, this one here. Uh, I assume everyone in our, in our session here followed the NFL controversy with Trump, right? And so of course you could go on and on about Trump should or shouldn't do this or that. But the question is when Trump is talking about these things, what is he not talking? Uh, so this was Juvenile's point about the bread and circuses. I see some pushback here. It looks like, uh, 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 I, so, uh, yes, let me, let me at least acknowledge, I, I can't read all, all of these things in real time, but I don't mean in any way to say it's an equation between ancient Rome and the United States. And I'm certainly not trying to side with one uh, political take or another. I simply want to point out that this is how certain caricatures have interpreted Juvenile's phrase. Uh, I didn't put these memes or anything together myself. Uh, he has yet to build a giant statue of himself. Uh, social media is a distraction. Yeah, this is very interesting. Of course, not really government-led in that case, um, but it's certainly out there. I would say not discouraged by the government. 
So I was going a little fast. Andy, if we've got another just two minutes, I thought I'd show please, this. Yeah, please do. And Mike, uh, thank you for taking a moment and kind of backtracking there. And I, you know, as as I was hearing you speak and I could see some of the comments happening in the chat box and imagining what teachers are thinking, that seemed to be a place to really kind of sit down for a moment. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. So this guy here, uh, somebody tell me if you know, who is this guy on the right? Can we see it in the chat? Gibbon. Yeah, very good. Gibbon. First name. Anybody get the first name? Edward Gibbon. Very good. So Edward Gibbon is basically contemporary with the founders of the United States. He was from England, lived in Switzerland for a while, but he went to Rome as a young man. And he sat down on a, a set of steps on Capitol Line Hill and he looked out over the forum and he said, wow, why can't we build stuff like this anymore? We used to, I mean, the Romans thousands of years ago could do all these amazing things. And so he, looking back, wrote a famous sentence. He says, and he wrote a whole long book, very long book, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He was interested in how Rome came unglued. And this famous sentence, he says, if a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world, during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous. He would, without hesitation, name that period which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. Now, what he means is to say, uh, or in, in other words, the happiest material conditions for human beings were under some of the most tyrannical emperors of ancient Rome. Now, we could argue uh, all day long whether, you know, this is true of most people who lived back then or or all kinds of other things. But the paradox is that in Gibbon's view, and with some justice, uh, if you had lived in ancient Rome, you would have been happier without all these political freedoms. This is definitely the time that all the famous stuff is built. The Colosseum was built under the emperors. Uh, whoop, let me give my next one. Hadrian's Wall built, uh, all the stuff that's still there. The Pantheon, all that was built under emperors because uh, this is sort of an interesting point. Republics, democracies, they can't usually build stuff on a grand scale. The taxpayers don't want to pay for it. Uh, and so if you want grand civic architecture, you got to go to tyrants or to authoritarians. Uh, Paris is a great example. The whole place looks like a gigantic single uh, organized palace because of the way the architecture was all done under uh, one of the kings. You can't do that under um, electoral politics doesn't typically work anyway. Uh, at any rate, if, if Gibbon sounds great, you wanna be careful because that, that time period is when Rome was still expanding, conquering other uh, countries and absorbing their wealth. In the third century AD, however, uh, there's a period that Rome undergoes that's called the crisis of the third century. And this is where Rome becomes what I would call an Orwellian sort of empire, it becomes something completely different from what it had ever been after a thousand years. The population starts to shrink. There's a long economic depression. Uh, the government's response, because they don't have enough money, is to increase taxes. The other thing they do is they debase the coinage. In plain English, they inflate the money. Uh, what had been hereditary succession, that is to say, your son succeeds you as the Roman emperor, is now replaced either by violence, just one coup after another, or even in a couple of famous cases, an auction. Uh, there's a case of a, an emperor named uh, Didius Julianus, uh, and the Praetorian Guard, the bodyguards, after one of the emperors had been killed, they said, who wants to be emperor most? Let's put it up for auction. It'd be like going to eBay, and you could be emperor if you bid the most. He didn't last more than a few months. The secret police get more powerful. Then you start getting religious conflicts as well, uh, and you get incessant warfare abroad. Finally, uh, what's very interesting, if you think about today's discourse, in the year uh, 376, in the year 376 AD, there's a famous moment where you start getting waves of refugees coming from Northern Europe, fleeing the Huns, and uh, they ask to be given permission to come into the Roman Empire. Uh, permission is granted by the emperor, but it's badly mismanaged. And so um, huge numbers of people come in and they can't necessarily be assimilated, causes endless problems. Uh, and a hundred years later, Rome falls, mm. more or less. So anyway, that was the the formal end of what I had to say. I've got some bonus stuff, but I want to turn it over to Sky and give her some time. You know, before you do, Mike, and I want to make sure Sky has uh, all all of the time allocated to her. But I do want to ask you one one quick question, and that is, um, 
how aware were both the leaders and the common just everyday citizen of 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 this of this demise how how aware were they, were they of the boiling water of, in which they sat so it's a terrific question the best way i heard it put was by a lecture uh by a professor at the university of chicago a couple summers ago we were all in florence ada palmer uh professor ada palmer who some of you may have heard of uh she said in her view and she's a specialist in this that it would start in small ways the average person would go to a store to buy um regular goods and you don't see them uh on the shelves right away and the example she gave most interestingly was uh the ancient equivalent of a tampon she said maxi pads in the ancient world were imported from spain and uh as the empire starts to break apart the supply lines start to fail and uh so very soon in in most of the provinces things would just start disappearing from the shelves uh so that's her view. I have a slightly different view. I can show you on the slides here. The traditional story, which may well be open to challenges, is that, uh, let me just uh, skip past this. Uh, what happens is that uh, there's a series of civil wars. Yeah, let me go back. Uh, there's a series of civil wars in the western half of the Roman Empire in the fourth century. Uh, there's a strong man named Constantine who defeats all his rivals. And becomes an extremely powerful emperor. Um, he famously proclaims toleration of Christianity, which had been illegal up until that point. Uh, and then to bring us full circle to where I started, uh, about 70 years later, Theodosius issued the edict that made Christianity mandatory, uh, which again is um, something you will see in governments if you want to think about this with your students. Um, a lot of times people think that a good policy that tolerating the policy, uh, if the policy is good, we ought to make it mandatory. Uh, schooling is a good example, right? We don't just allow people to go to school, but we compel kids to go to school. Uh, and there, there are, you know, you could do that with virtually any initiative you want. Uh, but at any rate, so the Western, I, do I have the slides? I'm not sure I do. Uh, in 476, there's a final guy named Romulus Augustulus, this weak empire, emperor who's overthrown by, um, an invasion uh, by Germans. Uh, they were regarded as barbarians back then, but a different way of life. And according to the most historians, the supply lines to the city of Rome get cut almost immediately. If you live in a city and there's no food at the grocery store, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna eat lunch? How are you gonna eat dinner? How are you gonna get breakfast for your kids, for your family? So the historians say that that's when the urban population retreats to the countryside and they take refuge at the big country houses of the Roman elite, the villas, and uh, the villa owners allow them to live there, and in response and out of fear, they begin to fortify the villas. Those villas, those country houses, become the castles of the Middle Ages, and as you might imagine, immediately you revert from this very complex economy to a subsistence economy where people are dealing in barter and uh, local uh, scale of trade goods and that sort of thing. So that's when Rome enters what used to be called the Dark Ages for several hundred years, where there's very little evidence of activity, uh, literacy, very little evidence of uh, economic trade with foreign powers or anything. Anyhow, that's Mike, Mike that, thank, thank you for doing that. I mean, it's, um, you know, again, it's it's an important way to sort of contextualize all of what's happening. Um, I do want to say, make sure that we spend some time with Sky tonight as well. So, uh, Sky, I'm going to unmute you now. And we're going to go. There you go. Hi, Sky. Thanks for joining us from Boston. Absolutely. Happy to. And thank you so much, Mike and Andy. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to this next part of the webinar. Um, here we're going to be focusing on the pedagogical angles that you can take toward interpreting this history with students. Um, and what I'm really hoping is that you come away with something that you feel like you could use in your classroom the next time that you're teaching, whether that's Monday or next September. Um, so first off, I'll give you a little bit about me. Um, my name is Sky Shirley, and I'm currently in my seventh year of Latin teaching. And over the summers, I work as a tour guide in Rome, and my passion is finding ways to make this massive amount of Rome's fascinating history manageable for teachers like me um, to work into their curricula. So today, I want to give you ideas for lesson plans and classroom discussion prompts. And all of these are inspired by the same themes that we've been exploring in the webinar so far um, and really moving them into classrooms. 
Um, so each area of Roman history has several major cultural trends. Um, and obviously there are more than I would be able to talk about with you tonight, but I certainly, um, I hope that you can come away with at least what I see as like some of the big broad strokes that um, go on throughout these types of government. Um, so a republic, for example, promotes conversations um, about representation and equality, um, and I'll provide some lesson plans for you to use to help students think more deeply about these issues. So when I taught sixth graders like Gemma, who's in this picture, I found that simulations and role play work really well when teaching complex forms of government. So these kids, they want to go home and play with their Beanie Babies and um, you know act out skits, and if you can bring that into the classroom, they're just going to pay attention a lot more. Um, so there's a lesson plan that I use every year um, with these younger classes, but you can use them up through high school. And we simulate different voting structures. First, I'll tell students, we're going to be in a democracy. And all the students vote on a ballot similar to the one on the right. So I have a Roman Republic questionnaire. Um, and we tally up the winning choices. And then I usually ask students, did any of you get all of your choices? Did anybody have all the choices on the ballot win? And we take whoever that was, whoever had the most votes in common with the votes of people, and this student becomes our representative. And I usually let them know that from now on, we're going to be in a republic. This student, who is our elected representative, gets a new ballot of issues to vote on. And while the student votes just outside the door, the others usually get to watch a fun Rome-themed cartoon or color or do some other activity. Um, and when the student returns with the decision, usually this sparks a debate over whether we agreed with the outcome of the new ballot. So kids usually have really strong reactions to this because some of them feel frustrated by how the leader voted. Um, and this usually gets us talking about how we have a democratic republic, one that balances the power of individual votes with the need for elected officials so that not everybody needs to be voting all the time and so the people we elect vote for us. Um, they're usually also pretty reassured that um, I do have some ways in which my vote counts just as much as everybody else's, um, for example, like on local issues. Um, and they come away with a much stronger understanding of representational government because they participated in it actively. So moving forward, another theme that is frequently discussed in, um, in republics and that's really familiar in American classrooms and society is equality. Um, so for this webinar, Scott, yeah. you're going to just tell me when you want the slides advanced. Okay, you can advance, sure. Um, so for this webinar, you hopefully have had a chance to read the text on Polybius, or maybe you will soon, um, in which he attributes the strengths to, of Rome to its balanced government. Um, in fact, this text picks up very similar themes to Langston Hughes' poem, Let America Be America Again. And I know some of you are English teachers or history teachers. Um, so you may know it. And in this poem, Hughes describes that America has a potential and a dream for equality, but that it hasn't reached it yet. Hughes says something along the lines of, uh, America never was America to me. And this poem might allow students to access Polybius with a little bit of a closer reference point. Um, it's also important to remember that although Rome was very multicultural and multiracial, there really aren't enough classroom materials that reflect this. Um, I teach at a school that is 55% students of color, and having a curriculum that at least in some ways strives to connect to all American experiences as well as black and queer experiences like those of Hughes can really help students see themselves a little bit more in the curriculum. And the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, Demnatio Memoriae. So these are two words in Latin which uh, Mike Fontaine has already introduced to us, um, but we can see already damnation of memory. And so I'm, I'm thinking one thing that I would love to know from you all is when you look at these two images, do you see anything that's connected? I mean, we see on the one hand, obviously an ancient image and on the next one, a more modern one. So what do you see in these two images? We'll give folks a chance to comment. Alicia says, great parallel. Uh, difference, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and a faced image on the left, that's right. 
So we can see three people who are clearly depicted and one that's, yes, absolutely removed, like what Amelia is saying. Um, and then what about the one on the right? Absolutely. So it's a Confederate statue, and this is a photo taken just within the last year. Um, so the conversation is still going on about how do we deal with a complicated historical past and one that we don't necessarily want to encounter in public spaces. Um, so essentially what damnatio memoriae means is that when there's a political figure who becomes unpopular, sometimes the Romans would condemn even the memory of this individual. Um, things like wiping the face out of frescoes, like the one on the left, They'd topple statues, they'd erase names, they'd even melt the faces off of coins. And the surprising thing is, is that we rarely hear the term damnatio memoria anymore, but there's still this impulse to remove reminders of the past that's still with us. So these days, I think it surfaces in ways that we try to figure out as a country whether or not we want to remove things like Confederate monuments. So moving forward, if you'll help me out, Andy, let's slide. Thank you. Um, the Romans struggled with these issues too. So to the right, we have, or actually to the left, um, there's the colossal statue of Nero, which we saw earlier. And this act, actually this statue was near the Colosseum and gave the arena its name. So the Colosseum was known as the Flavian Amphitheater at the time, but because it was next to the colossal statue of Nero, it got the name Colosseum quite late in its history. So this is a statue of Nero who was known as a brutal emperor and somewhat insane. Um, and after his death, Romans were understandably pretty uneasy about this massive statue remaining in the city center. And we don't really have enough record of what the ancient conversations were around what to do with it. But we do know that the response was to give the statue some new accessories to make them appear not like Nero, but like the god of the sun, Sol. So he was given a radiant crown and his face was changed so that he did not look like Nero anymore. So far be it from me to recommend putting feather boas or clown noses on Confederate statues, but I do think it's interesting to learn that these concerns are not new. Um, in fact, I'm not the only one out there drawing the connection between Damnatio Memoriae and Confederate statues, because if you all you do is run a quick Google search, you'll find plenty of articles and interpretations on the issue. Um, so plenty of people are weighing in, and hopefully we can bring the term of Damnatio Memoriae back into conversation. Um, so moving forward, um, for teaching Roman history, I really recommend that you start out by defining Damnatio Memoriae through the helpful uh, YouTube clip. There's a YouTube clip that I'm going to make sure that I get you guys um, at the end of this. And share images like the ones of the Severans. So um, the Severan Emperor's family where Gita's face is blocked out. Thank you so much. Perfect. Um, so it's fun to start this conversation by asking students to raise their hand if they have a sibling. Um, and then I ask, how many of you have ever just, you've been around your sibling and they're driving you crazy, you're just like, oh, you've got this rage inside of you. And usually a few students can relate. I know I, as an older sister of a little brother, very much felt that way. Um, and really the story of the Severans is just an extreme case of sibling rivalry. We have Julia Domina in the image as Empress. Her husband, Septimius Severus, which in English we usually say Septimius Severus, uh, was emperor, and their sons, Caracalla and Gita. Um, the sons are told at their father's deathbed to be nice to each other. What do you think? Were they nice to each other? <laughs> Does anyone know the next part of this story? Well, their, their name is Severus, so you can only imagine. They weren't good at sharing, very true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to ask of two brothers. So what immediately happens is that Caracalla kills Gita. And he also imposed a damnatio memoriae on all of the references to his brother. So in this image to the right, we can see that Gita's face is erased. And you can certainly find other images of damnatio memoriae in Rome, all the way up to Mussolini's name, scratched off of monuments, like the one that I posted in the comment section. Um, but what I think is really gonna help students internalize the concept is to connect it to their lives today. So 
I've proposed the idea of Confederate statues. Can you think of any other examples that you or students might bring up that relate to a more modern application of Damnatio Memoriae? You know, in some ways, um, Sky, you could argue that, that curriculum is is just that, right? We choose certain histories to remember and, and others to, to, to forget or to, to at least not add to our curriculum. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm keep these uh, suggestions coming. This is fantastic. Um, and yeah, certainly when I mean the modern world, <laughs> the modern in my mind is anything after 476 AD. So you can keep that in mind. Um, so some that I came up with um, are in the next slide, Andy. Um, so you can just move us forward. Thank you. Um, they have to do with renaming places that are linked to our country's racism. So for example, we have the image of Christopher Columbus, which I saw some of you um, suggested. I also like the cropping ex-friends out of your Instagram photos. It's pretty funny. Um, and uh, certainly there are a lot of issues that come up in the media and you don't have to look far for it. So there are things like, for example, there's a fascinating conversation right now over what to do about a town called White Settlement, Texas. Um, and people weigh in on whether or not they want to rename their town. But you actually don't have to go from Boston to Texas to be able to get these stories because my very school district, which is Brookline Public Schools right outside of Boston, um, we have a debate going on in my town right now about whether or not we should um, rename a school because the, the namesake of the school owned slaves and was part of Brookline's slave trade. So I think that it, just a little bit of sleuthing in their communities, um, students will be able to find a lot of things that relate to them. Um, so I think an understandable pushback from this is, well, yes, we certainly would like to have a much more doctored version of um, American history, one in which we don't have so much named after people who we don't want things named after. But we also still have Washington Street that goes straight through our town, and we have Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill. So um, perhaps one of the things that's really important, both before, during, and after action, is reflection. Um, and thinking about whether or not these even fall under the category of Demnatio Memoriae. Is Demnatio Memoriae a good goal? Um, and what are the best ways to learn from difficult history? So um, moving forward into empire, there's certainly other themes that come up. Um, one of them is um, this nostalgia for a golden age. So when you feel as though you've lost a lot of your representational government, you might think back to a simpler, nicer time. Um, and so basically the Roman poet Horace was commissioned to write for these public celebrations called the Ludi Saeculares. Um, and I recommend that you check out his poem as well as the Eclogues, which is a collection of nostalgic poetry by Virgil who was another public poet who wrote on commission. Because these poems can show you a perspective on the issue of a golden age that's still common in society today. So maybe inaugural poems are our equivalent of these uh, publicly commissioned poems from ancient Rome. Um, and the next suggestion is just a more recent one. Um, it's The Gift Out Right, which is an inaugural poem that's full of a nostalgia for an earlier America. And it was written by uh, Robert Frost. And he read it at a certain president's inauguration. So can anyone guess who that president was that Robert Frost wrote the gift outright for? Yeah, you know it. Great. JFK. Absolutely. So um, again, just as a connection to you may be working in diverse populations, or I would argue even if you aren't, um, it could be valuable to contrast that with a more recent poem, like for example, Richard Blanco's um, poem, One Today, which he read at Barack Obama's first inauguration. Um, and he is a Latino and gay poet whose work is very much worth considering. Um, so these are examples of ways that you can compare and contrast within a class. I think that they're gonna generate a lot of conversations. You could certainly have students juxtapose images like this one. Um, and we can really ask the questions. So they're coming up back in ancient Rome, they're coming up now, when were we great, right? We say make America great again, but were we ever great? Was it great for everyone or just for some people? And what can we do to be great again if we already were great? So there are a lot of directions that you can take in teaching this material, a lot more than we can go into today. 
Um, but I hope that you t come away with a few tips that I find absolutely indispensable in my own teaching of the content. And the first is pre-reading. Basically, that students likely already know some content, and brainstorming ideas before learning is a great way to strengthen recall. And it also helps to have visible reminders of the theme and revisit it with post-its of examples or a walk around the classroom. So for example, students could bring in uh, their own images of a golden age and leave that near the poster of the words golden age. Or students can make their own connections and I think encouraging them to bring in their own resources is going to boost engagement. So encouraging them to check newspapers and interviews and podcasts um, will help because kids tend to like to listen to each other a lot more than adults. Um, and then finally, I think it's really just important to teach what gets you fired up. So um, these are some themes that I notice in Roman history that I get excited about and that my students really like to talk about. Um, but certainly, I, I hope that you use um, Mike Fontaine's lecture as a real springboard um, and that you personalize them to your setting because then I think they'll be even stronger. And so to help you in this process, I have provided a, a few questions just to reflect on this webinar and imagine ways to bring life uh, to life these ideas in your own setting. Um, so the questions I'm sure you're capable of reading, but we can just kind of launch into question and answer this way, are what are some parallels you see between ancient Rome and the issues discussed in classrooms today? Um, what are the benefits and dangers of applying history to the present? And finally, how might you teach one of these concepts? Thank you so much for listening. Sky, thank you. And um, uh, I want to bring Mike back online as well. Uh, Sky, I'm going to leave your microphone on. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, I'm going to bring you back. Uh, there you go. Um, and so, you know, I've had a chance to to be in these conversations with both of you for almost a year now. I've, I've heard you become and, and really convinced me of, of the sheer value of, uh, of the study of the discipline. Um, but I want to ask each one of you, and I, I'd like you to weigh in uh, maybe from uh, primarily from your teaching perspective, whether that's teaching undergraduate uh, students in Cornell or teaching high school uh, age kids in Boston. Um, from your perspective, you know, kids walk in the door, they sit down, they, they probably have a certain, um, I don't know, a certain distance from the material. Uh, they, they probably aren't quite sure why this matters. So what do you tell them? Why, why does this matter? Why, why is this something that we should consider, not just if we teach Latin or if we teach the classics, but if we teach world history, if we teach literature, if we teach uh, politics, if we teach other humanities? Tell, tell me why this matters. I, mean, I think um, Mike Fontaine just really, I was, I think you hit the nail on the head by providing us with the Tacitus example of, you know, if you don't understand history and you don't study it, then you can kind of outlive public memory to the point where, um, you know, you could end up in a situation where nobody even remembers what, what the mistakes were of history, what the strengths were of history, and then you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Mike, why does this matter? So, uh, Scott, great answer. I would agree with you there. And I think for, you know, people in the United States, we have sort of a special relationship to Rome. Uh, and again, this is something we could argue about all day long. But here's a really strange thing most of us don't actually think about. It. When the founders decided to come up with a new form of government for the United States, they could have picked anything. There were all kinds of models. But they decided is really strange to reactivate the Roman Republic. They said, wow, we've seen all these forms of government in Europe, some were good, not so good here. What we're gonna do is go back to a model from 2000 years in the past. These, so the founders read Polybius in Greek, the very same Polybius that I asked people to read for today. And they said, wow, this seems like a pretty neat system and it worked for a long time. So we're gonna do that. Uh, so you've got on the one hand, the government that it, we share with Rome, um, in, in sort of broad connection, but also the the um, the essential core of uh, ancient Rome is this idea that it was a meritocracy, that despite your background, if you struggle hard and you work uh, hard, then you could rise up and participate in, in middle class life and that sort of thing. Now, again, whether that's true today, whether it was true back then, or things people can argue, of, argue about, but it's certainly relevant. And uh, Sky made a great point. If you don't know any of this stuff, uh, you're going to come up with some idea and think it's the cleverest thing you've ever caught and come up with and say, hey, how about we try my idea? And you won't appreciate that people might have tried it a few times in the past. 
Uh, so yeah, and then of course we didn't even get into all the fascinating literature and the fascinating artwork and all that sort of thing. We'll save that for uh, our next webinar together. Uh, Mike Fontaine, Sky Shirley, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Thanks to everybody. It was really fun. And I want to thank all of our participants for joining us tonight in this conversation. Um, I'm going to encourage you to keep an eye on the National Humanities Center website uh, for all of our upcoming both virtual and face-to-face -face, uh, work in education. That includes our social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter in particular. Um, I'd also like to remind you that uh, when I close the room tonight, if not beforehand, you will uh, get an evaluation uh, prompt and then by completing that you'll be able to um, download your certificate. If there's any problem, please reach out to me. Uh, I did record tonight's session and you will have a chance to have access to this. It might be helpful to go back with the PowerPoint and with the recording and pause and take some time to uh, collect your own thoughts or to make some notes or to see how the PowerPoint was structured. Um, and I, I want to uh, note that we have replaced, you know, last week many of you uh, came to a session that we had in, in place. Um, the system unfortunately didn't notify you that we had to cancel that for a conflict with the instructor uh, schedule, but we have added a new webinar in order to make up for that session. Uh, we'll be working with Bernie Carlson on the 25th of April, uh, looking at um, modern aviation. And I would highly encourage you to go in and sign up for that quickly. Um, many of our sessions are filling uh, fast and I wanna make sure that you have a chance to, to join that. Our next session, uh, April the 10th, will be uh, looking at Russian fiction and the, what it can tell us about the 20th and 21st century. I would love to have you join in. My, I think we have just a few more slots left. Our sessions on Cuba with Luis Martinez Fernandez and uh, 1984, the novel with uh, Alex Wallach from Stanford, have both sold out. But if you're interested, send me a note. I'll add you to the waiting list. Um, I know we have some, some slots uh, left for this Russian uh, fiction session, though. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Have uh, either continue to have a wonderful spring break or uh, have a good, good, good Friday tomorrow. We'll see you next time in the Humanities in Class webinar series. Thank you.